their way in from the waiting. And we will get started in just a moment. All right, welcome everyone. Thanks to everyone who is joining us live for today's Lunch and Learn, Understanding Your Ballot. And thanks to everyone who is watching the recording on YouTube. If you are still feeling confused about what you will be voting on this November 7th, that's Tuesday, you're not the only one. With Election Day fast approaching, we are so grateful to be joined today by Emily Cook, who's the Director of Communications for Maine's Secretary of State. Emily is gonna help us make sense of this year's ballot and answer all of your burning questions as she unpacks the 2023 referendum questions, including the slate of initiatives and what yes and no means for each question. We are so glad to have you with us. Thank you. My name is Kathleen Neal. I'm the Senior Director of Policy and Partnerships here at Maine Conservation Voters and Maine Conservation Alliance. Our organizations represent more than 13,000 members and supporters dedicated to protecting the environment and our democracy. MCA does that through education, collaboration, and advocacy, and MCV by influencing public policy, holding politicians accountable, and winning elections. Since 2020, this weekly online Lunch and Learn series has helped us achieve all of those goals, creating a shared space to explore our environmental and social history, our policy priorities, our climate action movement, and more. Few notes before we dive in today. We'll hear from Director Cook first, and then tackle all of your questions in the Q&A session at the end. You don't have to wait though, you can send those questions to me through the chat whenever they occur to you, and I'll keep track of them and synthesize those with similar themes and we'll get to as many as possible following the presentation. Please don't message our speakers directly as we want her to be able to focus on the presentation, not the chat box. If you have any technical difficulties today, Maggie Summers can help you out. Just send her a message through the chat. This event is being recorded and the video will be posted on our website later this afternoon, where you can also find recordings of all of our other programs. We have a number of different playlists on our YouTube channel that can help you dig into particular topics and would love to hear what is, what's popping for you and what's interesting these days. Thank you again for joining us. And Emily, I will hand it over to you. Thank you so much, Kathleen. Um, and thank you to Maine Conservation Voters for not only hosting this Lunch and Learn, but for inviting us um, to contribute. I know Secretary Bellows would have loved to be here herself. Unfortunately, she already had a conflict. So thank you so much for um, inviting or accepting me in her stead. Uh, so there are eight questions that folks will see on their ballot if they have not already um, picked up their absentee ballot. Um, if you haven't yet um, and you fall into a certain special circumstance, um, you can vote from now through Monday. Otherwise, um, everyone will be voting on Tuesday. If you do already have your ballot um, or you're waiting for it to come in the mail, make sure it gets back to your municipality by 8 p.m. on Tuesday so that it will count. Um, so the there's sort of two sections of the ballot. The first four questions are uh, citizen initiatives. Those are ones that groups of Mainers um, got together, proposed a piece of legislation, went out and got enough signatures to be able to uh, move this forward and get it on the ballot. They all went through the legislature and then were passed along for voters um, to make their voices heard on them uh, this November. Uh, the order of the questions um, is something that comes up often. Um, it is laid out in Maine law that these need to be in random order um, from a publicly um, you know, participatory process 
Um, just behind me is where we did um, a drawing of slips of paper out of a fishbowl um, in order to make sure that there's no, you know, some people think that there's a, uh, an advantage being earlier or later, maybe a disadvantage. And so that's why we make sure that this is done fully transparently without any um, weight given to any one question or the other. So question one, and is the, I don't see the slideshow, is it up up and going, are we good? Do you want us to run that? Sure. We can pull yeah. it up. Maggie, are you able to, to pull that up? Yes, just give me one second. Thank you so much. Sure. Thanks for bearing with us, everybody. We've oh. got a, well, you and keep going. We'll it's pre-election day. We're all we're all uh, that's right. Doing every all, all, all that we can to make everything work. Um, so I'll just I'll dive into question one while Maggie's working on that. Thank you so much, Maggie. Um, so question one, this question that people will see on the ballot is: Do you want to bar some quasi-governmental entities and all consumer-owned electric utilities from taking on more than one billion in debt unless they get statewide voter approval? So this question. Um, was proposed sort of in relation to what turned out to be question three, but given our random drawing, this one comes first on folks' ballots. So uh, as with sort of all of our first four questions, because these are proposals for new things, yes means yes and no means no. Um, in other years, we've had uh, perhaps a people's veto that asked people to approve or disapprove something that was maybe a repeal of something, the questions are a lot more straightforward because of what is being asked of voters. We do our best in those other years, but sometimes given the what's the underlying legislation, it can be more confusing. Hopefully it's not so much this year. Uh, so this would require additional votes for certain types of entities. Um, one question that has come up in other forums is why quasi-governmental is used here and not in question three. Um, when we get to that, you'll see that that word is not there. Um, while question three's language was being um, sort of going through the courts in a challenge, we had to draft question one um, and we used the same language in that that we'd originally used in question three. No one challenged it. That's why it's here and not in um, that other place. Because, and it's used because the um, entities that may take on debt are really delineated within question one itself. Um, and I would encourage folks to check out that list so that you're informed it's, there's seven different parts of it. So different um, entities that would be exempt from this additional vote. Um, other questions have come up about exactly how this would work. And as the election administrator, um, I think all that I can say is that there is a chance that this would end up in court. Um, exactly how everything would play out, um, as with a lot of questions these days, the level of detail would get worked out um, in the judiciary. Um, so I'll move on to question two. This is a campaign finance related question um, that was also brought by a group of Mainers. This one asks if you, uh, do you want to ban foreign governments and entities that they own, control, or influence from making campaign contributions or financing communications for or against candidates or ballot questions? So that's a question that we wrote for the ballot to keep it sort of understandable for voters and when they're making their yes or no. Again, a yes vote would implement this legislation a no vote rejects it. Again, uh, a little simpler than some questions that we've seen in the past. Uh, some other parts that maybe aren't as front and center in the ballot question themselves, the qu uh, question two also would call on Maine's congressional delegation to support and promote an amendment to the United States Constitution it doesn't lay out the exact language for it, um, but does call for that as well. There's another section within as uh, the underlying legislation that imposes a uh, due diligence requirement on TV and radio broadcasting stations, providers of cable or satellite television, print news outlets, internet platforms, 
with a couple of requirements um, towards this campaign finance regulation. Question three. Question three is probably the one that people have seen the most um, about out there in the news um, or in between the news and commercials. So the question itself is, do you want to create a new power company governed by an elected board to acquire and operate existing for-profit electricity transmission and distribution facilities in Maine? Um, you might have seen this referred to as Pine Tree Power. Those are the folks who organized to get this question on the ballot itself. So this one is the one that would create this new power company. Um, it would have uh, 13 members on the board. Seven of those would be elected um, from uh, one through five, six through 10, um, et cetera, of our uh, state Senate districts. And the other six would be um, selected uh, I believe by that board and um, that would work to essentially be uh, this new uh, governing structure for our electricity here in Maine. And again, this is the one that uh, question one is uh, somewhat in response to. Question uh, four is what you might have heard referred to as the right to repair. This is an initiative that, there we go, <laughs> um, reads, do you want to require vehicle manufacturers to standardize onboard diagnostic systems and provide remote access to those systems and mechanical data to owners uh, and independent repair facilities? Um, so this question is similar to one that you might have heard about a couple years ago in Massachusetts. Um, the goal from the folks who brought it, the folks who are called right to repair, is to allow local um, or non-dealer car repair shops to have access to certain systems as our cars um, and trucks get more technical um, and less um, of just motorized machines, but a little more like uh, traveling computers. So that is that one. Um, again, you might've heard that in Massachusetts that has gone to the courts over um, whether or not this can carry through. Uh, and like questions one through three, a yes vote means yes, you want to enact. And a no vote means that no, you don't want to. So that brings us to the constitutional amendments. Unlike questions one through four, these questions all originated within the legislature itself. Um, all of them can only advance when two thirds of the legislature in each house uh, votes to do so. So that means that all of these had pretty broad bipartisan support from our elected officials. Question five. I will read it. Um, admittedly, it is a little wordy, and then I'll give you a, a shorter version, um, that, a, a shorthand uh, that might be easier to understand. So the question that you'll see on your ballot is, do you favor amending the Constitution of Maine to change the time period for judicial review of the validity of written petitions from within 100 days of the date of filing to within 100 business days from the date of filing of a written petition in the office of the Secretary of State with an exception for petitions filed within 30 calendar days before or after a general election. So a shorter version of that could be, do you want to ensure that state election officials are able to focus on our presidential and gubernatorial general elections and hit pause on reviewing uh, citizen initiative and people's veto petitions 30 days before and 30 days after without impacting uh, the petition process itself. So this really came about because last fall, uh, days before our uh, 2022 general election, we received two sets of uh, petition signatures. There were tens of thousands of signatures on each one and our election workers in the state elections division who were already busy 
um, you know, up to their eyeballs in election administration and preparation for those um, gubernatorial, congressional, all our legislative races, any county, um, all that. And now they were expected to, within 30 calendar days, which included election day, veterans day, and Thanksgiving, um, get all those tens of thousands of signatures reviewed. You know, we brought in temps, we had people, um, some of our colleagues from BMV volunteering to do extra time to help out their, their compatriots in elections, which was, was really kind of them. Um, and we got it done, but it was, it's unsustainable for the future. So that's why we worked with the legislature on this question to bring it forward. It is wordy like this because the time frame for review within the constitution uh, gives us those 30 calendar days. And then it also lays out a time frame for which someone can challenge it. Say we um, validate a petition to move forward and people who are opposed to it want to challenge that. Or we say, no, this petition didn't have enough signatures. It can't move forward. The people who brought that might want to take that to court. And that's their right. This gives a larger amount of time for that process to happen so that it, we are reviewing things with the care that it deserves without potentially compromising our election administration in the future. We want to make sure we do both of those things really well. And we did it last year. We just hope we don't um, risk folks burnout in the future by doing it all at once um, over and over again. Now, question six um, is another one that you've probably heard a lot about. This is the one that would require all of the parts of the main constitution to be printed. Now, something I didn't know before I started in this office is that the Secretary of State is the person um, required to print up our official copy of the main constitution. Now, that makes a lot of sense. We also have um, our original drafts where um, Maine was decided to be a state and not a commonwealth like um, Massachusetts was. And we keep our original one um, quite safe because it is the basis of all, all our laws here in the state. There are some sections which right now we are not allowed to print. So after Maine became a state and a few decades had gone by, they did a little bit of a, a cleanup uh, convention and while we don't have the notes from that convention, the end result of it was that we are prohibited from printing certain sections in the official uh, record. Part of those, that language are uh, in reference to treaties with the Wabanaki nations. So question six would require that we print all of those parts. Um, as a person or as the office that prints that up, making sure that Mainers have the knowledge of all of our constitution, that, that thing that undergirds all the rest of our laws is really important to us. Um, and so we, along with um, many other entities, testified in favor of question six when it was before the legislature. Um, like with question five and the ones before it, a yes vote would um, enact this question and a no vote would not. We also uh, reprint the constitution with all of the changes that have happened in the last year on every uh, three years. So uh, later this year, uh, we will do that recodification um, and reprinting. And this will decide whether or not those uh, passages from article 10 are included or not. Questions seven and eight are a little different, but in some ways similar to question six. Um, question six asks us to print all of the parts of the constitution. Question seven and eight ask if we are going to remove things from the constitution that are not allowed to be enforced. So right now, if you went to the constitution, you would see a requirement for circulators of citizen initiative and people veto, people's veto petitions to be main voters. Um, meaning they would have to be main residents since that is a requirement for registering to vote. However, it has been ruled unconstitutional um, under the First Amendment of the U.S. Constitution. And right now, we 
are not allowed to enforce that provision. So question seven asks, do you favor amending the Constitution of Maine to remove a provision requiring a circulator of a citizen's initiative or people's veto petition to be a resident of Maine and a res registered Maine voter in Maine requirements that have been ruled unconstitutional in federal court? So what's interesting about seven and eight is that on the ground, nothing will change whether or not these are passed. The only thing that will change is whether or not they are printed in the constitution. Right now, the language that is being asked to be removed is still printed there. If you went to the constitution and read it, which I wouldn't be surprised if several folks on this uh, call have done, um, since you're all dedicated to know what's going on, uh, you would see this and you might think that it's enforced because why wouldn't you? Um, but because of that uh, decision, we are not allowed to enforce that provision. And you might get a, a wrong impression about what the requirements are for circulators um, currently. So that, that is question seven. And then question eight is similar in that it asks, do you favor amending the constitution of Maine to remove a provision prohibiting a person under guardianship for reasons of mental illness from voting for governor, senators and representatives which the United States District Court for the District of Maine found violates the United States Constitution and federal law. So in um, around the 2000 election, three women in Maine sued for their right to vote. In the Constitution, as it reads right now and as it read then, there was a pro prohibition against people under guardianship for reason of mental illness not being able to vote. The result of those uh, women suing for their right to vote is that they have it. Right now, everyone in Maine who is a citizen, a resident of Maine, and for a referendum, 18 years or older to vote, they can, everyone can vote. That is, that will not change whether or not this question passes. Everyone under guardianship for reason of mental illness will retain their right to vote even if this fails, but what would happen is that the language that is no longer accurate would remain in the constitution. So voting for question eight does not take or remove anyone's right to vote. It just makes sure that our constitution is accurate with what's there. Again, if someone under guardianship for reason of mental illness went to their constitution to find out if they have the right to vote, they might read what's there now and think that they have been disenfranchised when in fact they haven't. So for that reason, we think it's really important to vote for question eight so that someone could go to their, that foundational document and see really um, what rights they have or don't have. So those are, um, actually, if you can go to the next slide, Maggie. So one thing that I really recommend uh, folks check out, you could print it out and bring it into the um, voting booth with you, is this Maine Citizen's Guide to the Referendum Election. It's um, quite long. It's been what I've been uh, working on uh, off of for this. It has um, information of the uh, language or the question that you'll see on the ballot. It has the underlying legislative language um, from the Office of the Attorney General. It has an intent and content section about each one. What are, what are folks going for with this question? What's, what's in it? There is a fiscal impact statement that the legislature's Office of Fiscal and Program Review puts together. So what would be the financial impact of this? And then under Maine law right now, three groups either, um, three groups for and three groups against have the option of including some statements um, with their opinions on it. Uh, there are some of those within here. Um, and if there were any bonds, the treasurer would have a statement in as well. We don't have any this year, so um, Treasurer Beck doesn't have any sections. But it, it's a really great resource to have all of that neutral information in one spot for you. Um, like I said, you can print it out and bring it into the um, voting booth with you. There should be copies in each uh, polling location. It's right there on our website, as you can see. It's a really great resource um, if you want that really good neutral um, information. 
So um, with that, I think I'm good. Kathleen, are you the, the question master? Yes, thank you so much. I really appreciate that. There is so much on the, the ballot. And um, I saw I saw a fabulous post from your office just this week with Secretary Bellows reminding us that this is not a test. We are allowed to, to bring materials into the ballot box with us to really have good references and make sure that we uh, understand what we're being asked to vote on. It is really, really helpful. I wonder if before we can get into the, the details about the, the questions, could you say a little bit more about the role that your office plays in these questions? And I, I'm so grateful for that neutral set of inf source of information. Is that sort of the extent of your what you can tell us or or does the office take a position on these questions? Do you give us a cheat sheet of what you think the, the right thing to do is or just give us a little more context there? Sure. Um, so on the citizen initiative ones, we are charged with sort of being one of the facilitators of the process of those questions appearing on the ballot from getting folks the petitions that they then take out to voters to sign, designing those, making sure they have all of the legal requirements, um, working with the leaders of those to make sure that they understand what folks can and can't do, who can sign, who can't, um, that being main voters can sign. And if you're not, you can't. And if you sign twice accidentally because you didn't realize if you'd signed it six months before, we're only counting one of those. Um, then once those petitions get signed, they come back to us. We review those meticulously. Like I said, we're making sure that there's no duplicates so that the numbers add up all correctly. We see if folks met the thresholds uh, necessary to move on to the ballot. Um, if and when they do, we, we let folks know this is, what, this is what we found, this is why it's moving forward, they had enough, there were only this many duplicates, et cetera. Then um, when we, we put the ballots together, when we know what's going on it, so we have folks who design that. One thing you folks might not know is if you're absentee voting, we design the ballots specifically so that either the, both the front and the back, there's no bubbles. So if, um, say, you're processing absentee ballots and you open up um, Emily Cook's ballot, you would not see how I voted. Those then get opened up in bundles. Only once you have a, a stack of them do you flatten them out. That way, your right to a secret ballot is preserved even while you're voting absentee. So what I'm alluding to here is we also work on election administration. Once those ballots come out, we're working on training clerks, making sure that they know what they're doing. They have the materials that they need to carry out the election within their cities and towns. Uh, and then if we get to, we amass those results after election day, and if necessary, we conduct a recount. So on questions one through four, we do not take any position. Those are citizen initiatives. Those are up to main voters. Questions five through eight, we did testify on those in the legislature because they impact our work. Uh, we are that sort of subject matter expert on timelines around the citizen initiative reviews. Um, we are the people who need to print uh, the constitution every 10 years and make copies that go out to school kids and, and other uh, community groups. Uh, we're the folks who answer questions about, am I, um, allowed to register to vote? Can I cast a ballot? So because we have a professional hand in the, that work, we did take stances on uh, five through eight um, in favor, but at the same time, we're here to administer an election and whatever the outcome is, is the outcome that will be. And because of all the checks and balances that are built into our system, you know, the voters will tell us whether or not they pass because that's how it should be. That's really, 
really helpful. And I appreciate the distinction between the citizens referendum questions, which are which are up to us, the citizens of Maine, and, and those in which your office has both unique uh, perspective and a, a really important opinion on what, what will help and what will make the, the state stronger and, and, and better for all of us. So thank you. Um, I guess that is a good segue to, you're probably not gonna tell us how we should make up our minds about the, those first few pit questions on the ballot. Do you have advice for, for those of us, as you said, you know, question three, there's been a, a tremendous amount of debate, just so all of you know, um, MCV is neutral on that question. We do have a, a blog post up on our website, which we can, can share uh, that kind of outlines our thinking and why we did not take an organizational opinion on that. But there are there are lots of folks who did, and um, but but I'm wondering what the Secretary of State's office says when people call you up and say, "How the heck am I supposed to vote on this one?" Um, well, I think we'd start by saying you should vote however you feel you should vote. That is so important, and I think what's really what we're really lucky on in Maine is that we have a really robust and thoughtful media and. Uh, groups like MCV, which some have taken positions on some of these different questions. So I would seek out um, sources that you trust to give um, either not impartial opinions or people who's perhaps um, non-impartial uh, opinions that you, you trust and go to with other questions. Um, I know for example, Maine Public has been doing a series um, on the different questions, what they mean. Taking in all that information, if you have your ballot at home, pull up a debate that you found to be moving and you can listen to it while you're filling out your ballot at home. If you're in the voting booth, no sound, obviously, so that everyone can vote without any potential interference. But yeah, you can take in a cheat sheet if you wanna remember, or there was, an opinion piece in a local paper that you found to be really um, moving to you and the things that you believe in. Um, but I think what is most important is to vote your heart and what you feel is right. You also are totally within your right to skip a question. If you have strong feelings about seven questions and you just can't muster an opinion about the eighth, that's fine. <laughs> it is also within everyone's right to uh, not make a choice if that is what feels right to them. It's a, a sigh of relief. Okay, we don't have to know everything and it's not an all or nothing process. Um, really, really appreciate that. And I, I'm curious about this process of, of referendum questions. And if you could zoom out just a little bit and tell us, this is something that is really core to the way Maine, Maine people make policy. Is that true in other states too? Are, are citizen referendums a, a big deal everywhere? It's really mixed. Um, we see it a lot out West and not so much here in New England and on the East Coast. Um, I feel like California referendums are constantly in the news um, and they have numbers that, that we don't even reach. Um, which I think is helpful for our ballot preparations. Um, but it definitely uh, is a little unique to Maine, especially within our geographic region. And I think it speaks to Mainers. Um, Mainers want to really have a voice directly in what our laws and our governance looks like. And we've seen it be really strong in recent years. 2016 had a whole host of questions on the ballot of a variety of origins. And I think um, because Mainers are pretty used to it, they know where to find information that they find valuable in filling out their ballots. And, um, you know, I trust Mainers to make a choice that feels right to them. I really appreciate you giving us so much background on, on the sort of foundational. We do have more questions about the specifics, but one more on, on just the system. Mm -hmm. Have you ever considered printing these neutral summaries directly on the ballot or, 
or including oh, a, a link to the voter's guide, which by the way, everyone, uh, Maggie is, is grabbing that link from the slides right now. And we will share that with you via email later this afternoon. Um, but, but is there, has that ever come up of like, just making it super easy for us when we're standing in that little, little ballot box room? That's a good question. I'm not sure if we had, so one challenge might be, and you'll know this if you go to print it out, um, make sure you have enough paper in your printer. Um, this year's is 63 pages long. Um, so it's, it's chock full of information, but it is um, pretty lengthy. And some of that is the questions that Mainers are bringing forward. Um, some of the pieces of legislation are sort of at a core, several pages long. And making sure that all of the information that you need to have there is adequately explained. You know, if this, then that. We don't wanna shortchange anyone. So it can be, be a lot, um, but I, you know, it's a question we, or any sort of question like this is one that we're happy to consider. There's, you know, drawbacks and positives to any. One thing that people should know if you haven't seen your ballot yet, questions seven and eight are on the back. Um, you'll see it at, on on the ballot that there are questions on the reverse. So pay attention to that. If you are going to be voting on questions seven and eight, you'll need to flip your ballot over. Um, and that is something that happens when you have eight questions. And I guess for those of us who are going to be voting in person, it's it's a matter of juggling pieces of paper. When it, but when it comes to absentee ballots, more pages actually adds up right? in terms of the, the postage. Yeah. Yeah, and so depending on uh, your municipality, you might be voting for mayor, for city council, for school board. Um, Bath has a special election for the legislature, and Somerset County has a county commission question. So there's all sorts of other things going on, but yes, if you are mailing it back, one, you might consider dropping it off in person at this point, because um, while we absolutely love USPS, they have been so great to work with. Um, I know sort of on a sadder note, they, they were out on Sunday last week in Lewiston and other communities to make up for that lost time um, that even they were um, subject to that shutdown, um, that lockdown. And you know they wanna make sure that ballots get to voters and that ballots get filled out, ballots get back to municipalities by that 8 p.m. deadline. Uh, at this point, uh, even with USPS's superpowers, you might consider <laughs> bringing that back directly. A lot of municipalities these days have an absentee ballot drop box that is available 24-7 outside um, the municipal building. So that's a great option. You, know, you can access it on your own schedule, especially if you're caring for family or working or running to and fro. Or you can bring it right back to your um, municipal clerk. Uh, that way, you know, it's, it's all the way in and inside, whatever works for you. Um, just make sure it's back by 8 p.m. on election day, Tuesday, November 7th. Thank you. All right, let's go back to, to the rundown. And um, first, first sort of question, specific question is we know that, that question one and question three are are linked and and obviously we're all going to make up our own minds about those questions but is there sort of a, a internal logic of like you vote like you would vote yes on both or no on both or can you just review how they work together yeah so and even this you know i think people's internal logic may differ um <laughs> um i could see all sorts of different combinations of votes here if you are voting yes on question three, when you consider question one, you might wanna think about, depending on how courts interpret this, and I'm sure it'll be, anything would be a whole legal fight as has lots of utility law been in recent years. Um, there's the intent behind question one is to sort of cause another vote before question three would be implemented. How exactly that would work, I think I would leave up to um, some experienced utility law judges. Um, 
But I, that was the intent behind question one. Now, some people may say, yes, I want, I want pine tree power, but also I want another vote on this. That's, that's your right to choose that. Um, you might be a no on both. I, I, I can see all sorts of different combinations. Thank you. And I appreciate that. I, I don't, I truly don't mean to put you on the spot on this one, just trying to, to make it all make sense. And, and there's a lot to think about. So thank you for bearing with us. Um, let's go then to question four, which was the right to repair question. Um, does that include, you know, I, I know I've seen the vote yes on four at my local mechanics uh, shop. Does, does it also apply to off-road agricultural vehicles or is it just, do you know what sort of the scope is for that? That is a good question. I am frantically trying to skip ahead to question four to see if it is laid out there. Let's see. So question four. So there's different sections on different years of vehicles. Let's see. I'm not immediately seeing the word farm in here. Um, but I can't, I'd say, while we oversee the BMP, I've learned a lot about vehicles. Um, <laughs> I'm not, not much of a car girl myself. Um, and let's see, so the this is from the Attorney General. The initiated measure would require vehicle manufacturers to standardize and make available to owners and independent repair shops the onboard diagnostic systems of all vehicles, including commercial vehicles and heavy duty vehicles. So if that includes farm, then yes. If it doesn't, then no. Um, I, I, I don't know exactly where they might fall in. It, it sounds it, but again, um, if that's something that someone has a specific concern about, you might reach out to folks um, who are either for or against to, to get their opinion. Um, because uh, as with all lang legislative language, um, things can get interpreted by different people in different ways. <laughs> Thank you. I, I really appreciate that. And, and I've I've learned recently that um, it, while in Maine the Secretary of State oversees the the BMV, that's not that's not the usual across the the nation. So thank you for taking on that that other sure. body of work that you know some of your colleagues in other states may not know nearly as much about vehicles as you do. <laughs> Yeah, it's um, interesting. There's only a couple across the country, Michigan being the other sort of big example. So Secretary Benson um, out there has been a great partner in, in helping us with that. And for something like automatic voter registration, which I know folks on this call care about, it's great to have that data partnership between our Bureau of Motor Vehicles and our elections all in-house, um, which really helped make that um, election accessibility innovation um, possible. It is really cool. That's how I learned about it. When a, a partner in another state said, oh, you guys are so lucky that you have that under the same the same umbrella. So thank you. Um, you mentioned that that language inevitably has to, to be interpreted. And uh, this is this is why we have we keep we keep lawyers busy, right? Interpreting language in different ways. When questions pass, do they even go back to the legislature? So for those, any of these questions, will they go back to the legislature to, to work out any bugs or, or clarify that? Or what happens on the, the interpretation and implementation side? Yeah, so when these pass, um, they, in the same way that when a bill passes the legislature and the governor either signs it or lets it become law without her signature, there's a date when they become effective. Um, sometimes that's written into a bill um, in advance so that you know that July 1 of next year, this, this policy will be in place and we can do the work to make it happen. Um, for a lot of bills, it is uh, 90 days after the legis legislature adjourns. There's, I believe, some different implementation dates in uh, the citizen initiative um, questions. 
Um, and so beyond that, that's just sort of when they become part of our law. But like every other law that gets passed, a future legislature can amend things. Um, sometimes we like that, sometimes we might disagree with those. <laughs> um, we saw it happen with ranked choice voting, for example, um, when the legislature stepped in and said, no, we wanna rewrite it this way. Same thing with um, recreational marijuana. There were some tweaks that went in. Some people liked that there was that ability, some people don't. Um, in other states, and sometimes in under different city charters, there might be a sort of blackout period. We don't have that in Maine. When things get passed by voters, it goes into our statutes the same as it get, getting passed in the legislature. Thank you. Um, back to the going through the questions. Um, there was a, a on question five. That's the 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 one with the thirty day exemption. Will you, will you explain that again? Yeah. So right now, when someone brings in a petition that they have gotten, you know, 90,000 signatures on, they bring those into the elections division, which is under the Secretary of State, and we have 30 calendar days to review those. That is checking to see, is the Emily Cook who signed in January in Augusta in April in Augusta and March in Bangor, are those the same Emily Cook? Are they not? There have to be a lot of us, so maybe not. <laughs> but maybe someone moved and moved back and we're counting that once. Were the petitions all notarized correctly? Are, is there anything wonky going on with the dates? Um, some things are just sort of happen. You not, might not remember that you've signed something once. Sometimes we're investigating to see if something um, more concerning has perhaps gone on uh, in that signature collection. And like I said, it all happens in 30 calendar days, even if election day, Veterans Day, and Thanksgiving are within those 30 days. We don't, we don't get extras. Um, and perhaps two of them come in on the same day. We have to do both of those in those 30 days. And so that's what happened last year. Like I said, we pulled off a great election. We were number one in voter participation in Maine um, in the 2022 general election. We're so proud of it. And that's because I think voters have confidence that their vote matters and their vote will count because they will. Um, but pulling that off, uh, I would say nearly killed us. It was, it was exhausting um, and not something that is sustainable going forward. If we're gonna see all of these citizen initiatives coming from all sectors of our society and with all sorts of different interesting um, questions being raised to voters, we wanna make sure that we're doing that really thorough signature verification correctly. We also don't want that to damage our election administration. There's a lot that happens in the 30 days before election day and in the 30 days following. So one of the things that happened last year was on Veterans Day, we were in the office checking to see what exactly the results from Congressional District 2 would be. Would we be going to a ranked choice vote tabulation? Turns out we did. So we spent three days tabulating that. Um, some of you might have joined our uh, about 24 hours of Facebook live stream um, for all of that. Those are both really important things to do and do well. We did it, but we wanna make sure that the breadth and depth and accuracy on both of those things happens well. What question five would do would be say, if you bring a petition in 25 days before an election, uh, so only presidential and gubernatorial general elections. The other ones, we'll make it work. With those big ones, we wanna be extra focused. So if you bring something in 25 days a week before um, or a week after maybe when we're doing our CV, we will put those in a safe room. We will make sure that we have them all. And then once we hit that 30 days after election day, we'll dive in head first and do that signature verification. The deadline for uh, signatures to be verified to go on a November ballot is sometime in late January. So there would be no impact on when a question would be seen 
on the ballot by voters. Just a question of when we're doing that review. I am I am always in favor of being more humane to the uh, the good people who make this <laughs> make our state government work. So thank you. I really appreciate that. And uh, it's really helpful just to understand that the environment in, in which you all are doing really a, a Herculean task. So thank you. Um, question about the the main the referendum questions that have to do with the constitution for this on this ballot um do they just refer to to hard copies of the the constitution or does maine have a digital online version that's that's similarly constrained it it seems um counterintuitive that there are parts of the constitution that are in effect but not printed or printed but not in effect where do you find the real deal <laughs> Yeah, so it is confusing, um, and your constitution shouldn't be confusing. Um, so we, in the Secretary of State's office, are charged with printing sort of the official copy. Um, we have a vellum supplier that we will be uh, contacting for that real, um, the, the serious number one version. Um, then we also print up copies that we send out to schools and other groups that are learning about constitution. It's a great learning tool for young Mainers. Um, there are versions online. I know that's where I usually go when I need to do a quick reference um, and a control F for a certain section of the constitution. Um, whether or not they have all of the sections. Um, I mean, you can find article, the full part of article 10 online. We're just not allowed to print it in the copy that goes to the archives, which is weird, um, <laughs> pretty strange to think about. And then the two parts that are in the constitution but aren't in force, I like to explain as when the judges rule those parts unconstitutional, because they don't have the power to change Maine's constitution that originates within the legislature and must be approved by voters, they couldn't just add a little section that says, and the secretary should take this out. <laughs> but that's so that's what we're asking voters to do now. Say, the judges said this, we are not allowed to enforce these things. Should they still be there if they're not in action? And so does that suggest that those, those decisions, those judicial decisions have, have come down? Is, are they still working their way through some sort of appeals process? Or is this, this is settled? These are not going to be... These are settled. Okay. Yeah. So question eight, the cases that um, resulted in that decision were from the 2000 election. And Maine voters have been asked this question before. It didn't pass. And so the language is still in the constitution. Um, question seven was more recent. Um, it started with Sec then Secretary Dunlap being sued by We the People PAC when Secretary Bellows came into office. It, one under her name. So um, the case is We the People versus Bellows. Um, in sort of the first level court, um, we were not successful, though we, we fought to keep that residency requirement in because we defend the constitution and thought it was an important part of the citizen initiative process to have the circulators be mayors. Uh, we appealed that to the first circuit and got a similar uh, decision and considered appealing further, um, but prospects weren't good. And uh, the further you appeal something and continue to lose, the more attorney's fees you pay to the person who wins. Um, so that, that case is also settled and we have been permanently enjoined against um, enforcing that. So if someone were to come, say someone in this call wanted to do a citizen's initiative, um, one of the steps is that we meet with you to say, these are all of the rules that you have to follow. There used to be a point in those documents that said, and your signature uh, gatherers need to be main voters and main residents. Um, while the case was working through the courts and we weren't allowed to, we said, you know, this case is working through the courts right now. We're not allowed to force this. And now that's just no longer part of our training and can't be.
So thank you. That's it's really helpful to to get that. Now, can I ask the opposite question yeah. or the the flip side, which is who made the decision to stop printing the parts yeah. of the Constitution that are still in force around the the tribal treaty obligations? Yeah, so that stems from an 1875 Constitutional Convention. So um, the Mainers that made up- Just a up, few minutes ago. Just uh, somewhat recently. Um, you know, everyone on this call looks far too young to have been a part of it, but perhaps someone was. Um, <laughs> uh, so that was a decision made by Maine leaders at that time. Some of the sections are- the sort of cleanup of how you set up a state um, because we were separating from a former state becoming a new one. The, some of those initial steps were part of that um, though. And some of those are the things that aren't printed right now. Um, I think some people could find some potential logic in that regardless of the part where maybe the whole constitution should be printed so people can read it. Um, but like I said, we just sort of wholesale took Massachusetts's constitution and said, what do we want to change? If anyone wants to visit the archives to see that original where we said, we are not going to be a constitution we're gonna, or a commonwealth, we're going to be a state. And we have a lot of the back and forth from that original constitu constitutional setup. We don't have a lot of notes um, or any notes from the 1875 one. We know what the end result was, um, but not everyone is as good at keeping those sort of back and forth of, of debate um, as the original one was. So there's, I know some scholarship research about it, but sadly in the archives, we don't have a ton to say why. That's, it's really useful to know. I mean, it, it's, Thank you. That history, the history is always interesting. And I also am thinking we should have a lunch and learn field trip to the archives because I definitely want to see the original constitution. That's cool. Uh, if, if we vote, you know, if question six, if that passes, um, would, would anything change in the law or, or is this, I mean, I, fully, and, and MCV supports question six, um, and for all of those reasons of transparency and printing, sh sharing our, our full history, uh, but does it have legal ramifications as well? Or is that, does it add any additional language or we're just saying, no, let's print what we actually mean? I think that it means we just print what we actually mean and what is there in existence. I think some people might argue that it might change things, um, but that's not, that is not our view. Um, again, like these other questions, uh, lots of different lawyers with lots of different views can argue lots of different things. Um, but in our view, it just prints what is already there. It's just sort of hidden. We could actually, I say this every week and it's always true, we could go all day, uh, but I'm going to ask you one final question because I know questions one through four are, are the citizen referendums that, that we're going to make up our own minds and there are lots of good resources to help us to help, help us do that. Five through eight are the ones that your office has an opinion about and will yes. you remind us? <laughs> yes, yeah. no, yes, no, what they are. <laughs> So on questions five through eight, uh, we support yes votes on all of those. Um, but most importantly, we just want people to vote. Uh, vote your, your heart, your conscience, um, whatever those votes may be. We love to see a strong turnout. Hopefully um, we see you around the state on Tuesday. I'm so excited. I cannot wait for election day. One of my favorite days of the year. Um, so, so thank you very, very much. A reminder that you will all receive an email later this afternoon with a link to this recording. So if you want to dig back in and say, what did Emily say about that one again? Uh, you can do that, share it with friends. Uh, you'll also find links to the voter information guide to, to help walk through that again. 
feel free to take that on into the into your polling place with you and please 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 vote on Tuesday, reach out to folks who you think might need a ride to the polls or a nudge. Uh, just a, wh what time are you voting on Tuesday? It, we can we can help each other make made another great voter turnout um, year. Thank you so much, Emily Cook, Director of Communications for the Secretary of State. Please thank Secretary Bellows and everyone in your office on our behalf. Thanks to all of you for joining and for, for spending the time to make sure you're, you're informed and ready to vote on Tuesday. We will be off next Friday in honor of Veterans Day. And then on November 17th, we are teaming up with our friends at Maine Law for the third annual Indian Law and History Lecture. There is an absolutely terrific panel lined up. And this is the really exciting part you could join us in person at Maine Law's new Portland campus. Or if you're fond of joining from with your slippers on, uh, you can zoom in virtually as well. We'll take a short break in December. And so somehow this is our last regularly scheduled Lunch and Learn of uh, 2023. Thank you all. We're grateful for you uh, today and every day. And we will see you at the main law lecture. We'll see you in January. We'll see you at the polls on Tuesday. Thanks again. Thank you.